I'd like to turn to uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 13. I'm going to read it, like I said, I'm going to read a couple passages of Scripture here, um, so stick with me. But I want to, uh, I, I, I want to just talk about one of the applications I'd love to uh, chat about this morning. So, but first of all, let's dive into the identity issue here. Uh, first Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 13. If we're out of our minds in a bliss, divine ecstasy, it is for God. But if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. For it is Christ's love that fuels our passion and holds us tightly. Because we are convinced that he has given his life for all of us. This means all died with him. So, though, so that those who live should no longer live self-absorbed lives, but, but lives that are poured out for him. The one who died for us and now lives again. So from now on, we refuse to evaluate people merely by their outward appearances. For that's how we once viewed the anointed one. (laughs) Read that for the first time. (laughs) But no longer do we see him with limited human insight. See, that's so key right there. You no longer have to see him with limited human insight. Insight. God gave you a spirit to understand all things and all things well. See, here's the deal. The deal is identity. The deal is identity. If you don't know who you are, you're going to continue to live like that. If you know who you are, you're going to live like that. So we have to understand identity. We have to understand how to live in that identity. See, John, John 10, 10 tells me that this, well, let's read it. John 10, 10. Because this is an, I want to call it an absolute identity. A thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But I have come, Jesus said, to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. So that's the deal right there. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And what does he mainly do? I've been talking to a couple people this week just about this topic. It's so important. The devil, the enemy, the adversary, whatever you want to call him, three things. That's it. Steal, kill, and destroy. And guess what? His main thing that I see now is stealing. Why? Because if he can steal your identity, the other two are gravy. If he can steal your identity, you're as good as gone. If he can steal your identity, you don't know who you are. You don't know how to live life. You don't have a compass anymore. If he can steal your compass, he can destroy you. So don't let him steal your compass. Know your identity. Let's go back to uh, 2 Corinthians Because verse 17 says, Now, if any was, anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new person. All that is related to the older, older, old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. Isn't that good? That everything can be fresh and new. See, a lot of times that's the problem is people stuck in their identity and they say, well, no, it can't be for me. It can't be for, I, I can't, des- I don't deserve that. I don't, we didn't, no, nobody did. It's not about that. It's about God's love for us that he sent his only son to die and make this happen for us. That's the issue at hand. So Jesus comes to set a new world order into place. And when he sets the new world order in, he didn't change it. And he says, I've given you abundant life. Don't let anybody steal it. I've given you abundant life. Don't let anybody destroy it. I've given you abundant life. Don't let anybody kill it. It's up to you. It's the life that he gave you. The new creation means you're a new creature. I've seen in the Greek places where it's translated into species. Think about that for a second. 
And you're like, what? <laughs> no, I'm a human, I'm pretty sure. Spirit. It's a spirit awakening. Amen? So good. And God has made all things new, verse 18 says, and reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciliation, or reconciling others to God. In other words, it was through the anointed one that God was shepherding the world, not even keeping records of their transgressions. And he has entrusted to us the ministry of opening the doors of reconciliation to God. We are ambassadors of the anointed one who carry the message of Christ to the world. See, that's the deal. That's the identity. That's what we carry. See, identity is what you carry. So that's the compass. But the compass is no good unless you look at the compass. We have to look at the compass. The compass will always steer you in the right direction. It will always steer you in the right direction. If it's the new creation compass. Always. We are ambassadors of the anointed one who carry the message of Christ to the world. As though God were tenderly pleading with them directly through our lips. So we tenderly plead with you on Christ's behalf. Turn back to God and be reconciled to him. For God made the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God through our union with him. Union with Christ equals righteousness with God and we are the righteousness of God. That is one scripture at the end of one chapter in my Bible. Heard a preacher talk about Smith Wigglesworth one time. He said, let no one tell you that this, this is an iPad, okay? But that's the Bible. Okay, I'll just show you. He said, let no one tell you, Smith Wigglesworth said, no, let no one tell you that this contains the word of God. He says, because if you talk about books, books can be compared to each other. If you say this book contains the word of God, then you're putting it up for debate. He said, let no one tell you it just contains the word of God. He said, it is the word of God. And never change your mind or your stance on that. Because it is the word of God. Because the moment you put your righteousness up for debate, it's as good as gone. The moment you put your glory up for debate, it's gone. Because now someone's going to try to talk you out of it. But if you know, if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the word of life so that we might become the righteous of God through our union with him is so good. I was reading some footnotes from Francois about that word if. Paul wrote, therefore, if. He's saying that word if is not a condition, it's a conclusion. Did you hear me? That word if, because he said therefore, if anyone. He's saying it's not a condition. Take the condition out of it. It's not about a condition. It's about a conclusion. It's a, it's a finished work that's already done. Now the only thing you have to do is put your trust in it. You have to put your trust in it. And that's application that I want to talk about now, is your thoughts. Where do you go in your thoughts? Do you trust the Lord with your thoughts? Or do you put your trust somewhere else? I'd like to swing over to um, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. You know, the thing about thoughts is thoughts fuel lifestyle. And lifestyle changes culture. Everybody wants to change the culture, but they don't want the lifestyle. Yeah. 
It's a focus. It's that pregame that I was talking about. It's that focus that you have in life. Thoughts fuel your lifestyle. And your lifestyle will change the culture around you. David just talked about it. You talked about Watson, right? Thomas Watson. You talked about Johnson, the the big moguls of the area. IBM was here. It started, originated here. This is what the this is the culture that we surround that we're surrounded by. And now, what are we surrounded by? Big empty buildings. Is that the culture that you want? No, it's not the culture that we want. You know, BU's coming in and buying everything, and they're, they're, they're building their big pharmaceutical school, and they're doing a great job at what they're doing. And we have a college ministry called BASIC on campus. We want to affect every kid that comes in there. There's some people here that work there. Good for you. Change the culture. Change the culture. It's kingdom culture. It's not your culture. You're a part of it. Bring it. I'm not a part of IBM. I'm not a part of EJs. I'm all this stuff. I'm part of the kingdom culture. I'm a part of it. So I bring what I have. So it's those thoughts. The way that you shepherd your thoughts is going to be fuel for your lifestyle. Hmm. <laughs> you know, I... Uh, before we get to that scripture, I just want to use a, an example that my wife gave me the other day because those are always good and safe to tell. Um, you know, we were, we were talking about reasons why we come to church. Why do we gather on Sunday morning? And uh, I had a lot of different thoughts going through my head thoughts of why other people come to church. and But she says, you know, the reason why I come to church is that so people can see my lifestyle, my expression before God. And that hopefully I can model that in a way where people will pick up on that. That I just don't come to church because of law or because my dad was a preacher or because she's a pastor now. But we gather together to express the lifestyle that Jesus has given us, the freedom that he's given us, that we don't have to live by law, that we've been set free from everything. We're not tied down to anything. We're not tied down to any laws. But we come expressing ourselves together in worship. Was that amazing worship this morning? We got into lean back, and all I could see was Barbara Bates leaning back into the Father's arms. That's what I saw. And the comfort that I felt when I saw that was absolutely amazing. You know, I looked at Bill the other day and I said, I don't know how people can do this without the Father. I don't know how death is possible without God. Without the knowing. Without putting my trust in that. 2 Corinthians 10. Well, God is good, isn't he? Go ahead. And... Hmm. Wow. Verse 3. For we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. Did you hear that? We walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are are not of the flesh, they're not carnal, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when, when, you're disobedient, when your obedience is complete. 
That's powerful. What do you have up there? I was reading out of the ESV. Oh, was it out of the Passion? Sorry, Stacey, I should have sent you a text message this morning to tell you where I was going. The Passion's really good. But the stronghold there is, is what I want to talk about this morning. So there's a, there's a stronghold. And as a new creation, I want to ask a question, and I'm, and I'm going to get to the answer. So, so give me a second. Which stronghold are you going to choose? Which stronghold are you going to choose? Now, I know that you're looking at this going, well, not this one. I don't want this one. So what I see is a stronghold. So a stronghold, by definition, is a place that has been fortified as to protect it against attack. So now your thoughts, you put your thoughts inside of a stronghold. If your thoughts are in a stronghold, which stronghold is it? It's a scripture in Nahum that I want to get to that talks about how God is a stronghold. It's a dwelling place. Leanne, you prayed that this morning and you had no idea about the message. In the Greek, what that stronghold is referring to is anything on which one relies or where, or where they put their trust. See, I think we have a misconception about like good thoughts and bad thoughts. So a bad thought is not a stronghold. A lifestyle of bad thoughts is a place that's going to hold strongholds. Thoughts are going to come at you all the time. It's what you do with the thought. It says cast them down. Why did Paul say that? Because you're going to have to. Cast it down. So anything on which one relies or where they put their trust. Proverbs 21, 22. You know, so that, so 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6 there, talking about strongholds, it's like, it's talking about like personal. Culturally, we there's this verse here that says 21, uh, on, sorry, Proverbs 21, 22, a wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the strongholds in which they trust. As you're in a culture here in Broome County, you can see all the strongholds that are around. You can see where, you can walk into any community and what they put their trust in. You can see all the labels. You can go down into the south and you can see all the places where they make you know, their, their moonshine and their, and, their, and their alcohol. You can go, you can go into big cities and you can see, it, you know, about the New York Yankees and all the sports teams. You can see the culture inside of every single city. So, strongholds in this case are whatever people or culture trust in other than God. See, the issue here. It's not just about thoughts, but it's about trust. Do you trust God enough to put your thoughts in him so that God is your stronghold? Or have you had enough bad thoughts that you began to live a, you began to live a lifestyle of bad thoughts that you've put them in a stronghold? And you won't let God in. Because I've heard Pastor Chris preach an amazing message on this. About the corridors of the mind. And you let Jesus in and he's walking down. And he's looking in the rooms. And you're showing him all the clean rooms. But at the end of the hallway, there's that door that's shut. And you're not letting anybody in. Even God. The issue is, is God already, he's got x-ray vision. So he already sees through the door. And he's telling you, too, I've already seen your dirt. I've already seen the problem. Just let me in and clean it. Just let me in. Don't worry about it. Just let me in. And you're like, no, no, no. That's a stronghold. You're not letting God in because you're not putting your trust in him. You're putting your trust in whatever's behind the door. 
And you're like, oh no, I'm not putting my thought, I'm not putting my trust inside of that bad thought. Whatever it is, I mean, fill in the blank. I'm not putting my, thought, my, my trust in that bad thought. Yes, you are, because you're not letting God in. You have to completely rely on the Father. See, I think that we need to, to like, like, whatever you think about trust, and just, just times that by whatever the number is, and that's how God thinks about it. That's how God thinks about it. He wants your trust because he knows that when he has your trust, he has you. You are the new creation. He's already given you everything. Everything. And now he wants your trust. See, that's why I said last week during communion, I said, you know, it's in Hebrews it says it's impossible, without faith it's impossible to please God. And Scripture doesn't say it's impossible, it's without worship it's impossible to please God. Without Bible reading, which is, which is good, is, it's impossible to please God. It says without faith, because faith is a trust issue. Because it's an unseen thing. So where are you putting your unseen are you putting it in the Father, or are you leaving it closed behind that door? Are you living the lifestyle of the bad thoughts and housing the bad thoughts? See, that's the thing. That's, the devil wants to steal that from you, because as long as, as, long as he can keep that there, there's, there's, there's no redemptive solution. He, he wants to keep you isolated. That's what he wants. He wants to keep you behind that door. See, you think you're outside of the door showing God around. You're, you're behind the door. I would even go that far to say that. Like, you, you're, you're in it. These are your, these are your thoughts. You're, you're so deep into it. It's a trust issue. Just open the door. Just open the door. Open the door of your heart. God's here to clean. That's what the scriptures do. The scriptures cleanse. You read it, and you're reminded, right? All of a sudden, you're, like I said, you're reading maybe for the first time or for whatever time. Just... Think about it as a fresh scripture. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. See, it's not just that one moment. It's not just that one moment. I can read that scripture and all bad thoughts go. Because I have to. Because I trust the Father. And in Him is no darkness. So every dark thought Anything that I have can vanish as soon as I read that scripture. Isn't it the power of scriptures? They have that cleansing capability. It's like, it's like a soul scrubber. Like, for real. Like, it's just something, like, you can just sit there and just read it. It's like, you just get up in the morning and you read and you have that devotion time with the Father. And it's like, Lord, I can start my day now. I've started my day both ways. I would rather start my day with the Word. That's because... It is the book of life. It is. It is life. <laughs> oh. Good. Wow. You know, wherever your heart is, where your trust lies. <laughs> I listened to a preacher a while ago talking about money. And uh, he was talking about how the, how the world is trying to control how much money a person should make or have. And so he's asking this question, and he was, and he's like, I'm not asking you to answer the question. He's like, because it personally makes me irate. So he says, I don't think there's, there's no amount of money that anybody, like, there should be no regulation or rule. It's when does that money replace trust? He made a very good point. He said, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, Lazarus were very wealthy. But their hearts were all about the Father. Their hearts were all about helping Jesus through the ministry. And that's what they did. Followed him around and gave everything that they had. It's amazing. It wasn't a money issue. Nothing to do with money. All to do with trust. All to do with heart. I thought that was an amazing statement. 
Want to read uh, Nahum? Yes, that's a book in the Bible. <laughs> it's got three chapters. Um, I'm going to just pull these, these three scriptures out of it. But Nahum 1, verse 6. Uh, it's in this scripture where you can answer the question, which stronghold you're going to choose. Which, uh, and you can, you can change the word too if you'd like. What dwelling would you like to choose? Where do you want to put your trust? So Nahum 1, verse 6. Who can stand uh, before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. That verse 7. The Lord is good. Everybody say, the Lord is good. It's a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. He knows you. He knows, he wants you to take refuge in him. So back in the medieval times, if there was, if there was something, someone coming to conquer a castle, I mean, that's all it was, was wars waged back then. I mean, just waging wars everywhere. People just trying to conquer places, taking over land. The more land they had, the more powerful they were. And these kings and queens and their children and people, they'd all get into the stronghold. It all, huge, huge fortress, stone, a moat in front, drawbridge up, no one's coming through. And they would hide out in there. This is, this is so important to understand. Because this here, this is a, this, this is a stronghold of the revelation of the goodness of God. Understanding the revelation of the new creation automatically gives you stronghold in which you dwell. So if you know that for sure, you know where to run to. You know your hiding place, your dwelling place. Run there. Any time of trouble. And as you're there, I would love it if you would take a little time to examine yourself. See, that's what's so beautiful about being in the presence of the Father, is that it gives you that time to examine yourself. You know, we had this great conversation in a small group, and we were talking about, um, well, we were talking about the, the chapter of, I can't, oh, it was, was it 1 Corinthians 13? And um, the love chapter. And, wow, that was a fleeting thought. <laughs> you ever have a thought leave you so fast that you don't know if you're going to get it back? It's happening right now, I'm going to be honest. What's that? Examine yourself. Right. Examine yourself. <laughs> that, that thought, gone. That was a good one, too. <laughs> Quotable, probably. Oh, well. It'll come back, yeah. Portable, I, I meant. <laughs> but, you know, we were, oh, okay, so we were, we were talking about that, that chapter. <laughs> it's, thanks, Joe, I know you're praying for me. A shundable. And, uh, or stop goofing around, I'm going to lose it again. <laughs> but we were, we were talking about that scripture, and we were talking about how it's so, we're so easily offended. When, people, when somebody says something to us, we automatically want to either like A, correct them about how we're not that way. Like, like, like someone says to you, I mean, just simply like, why are you being mean? You know, you say something mean, and they ask you a question, why are you being mean? And I've, I've gone through this a hundred times with my wife. She, her answer is the same all the time. Just ask me nicely, and I'll do anything you want. That's what she says. So 
I've learned to ask nicely. But we often, especially when it comes to like the spouse, why are you being mean? We automatically go on the defense. I'm not being mean. You're being mean. What's, what do you mean I'm being mean? And, and all of a sudden you're mean, right? And you start ripping into the person that you love. Why don't we rather step back into the stronghold with the father? Let the father just give you a big old hug. It's what you need, actually, at that time. And then all of a sudden, take some time for some self-evaluation. And be like, why am I being mean, Toddy? Why are you being mean to Rachel? Is he being mean to you? I'm just kidding. But you hear what I'm saying? Instead of defending yourself, trying to go on this like offensive front of I'm not mean, you're mean. All you know, this this like this like reverse psychology that you think works every time but just digs you deeper into the hole. It's like your shovel actually gets bigger, Dave, every time it happens, right? Yeah. You, then now you like, well, you've probably gone from the excavator down to the regular shovel. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> He's working the excavator. But the self-evaluation, right, is you can take yourself back into the presence of the Father, and you can say, Father, why am I being this way? Why? That's not me. I'm the new creation. I am joy. I am peace. That's, that's who I am. You've made me this way. And I think it's, it's so crucial. And then you're able to take that moment with the Father. And not, so not every moment with the Father is about that. Don't get me wrong, okay? Like those moments when we're in worship and you're going for it, like you just, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a consistency is what I'm saying. My stronghold is constantly with the Father. Because in the book of Nahum, it tells me that. Because his, his, his wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. This is a prophecy over like Nineveh. But it says that the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. And it's so beautiful that he does. So how do you stay? I'm going to finish with this. I'm going to go back to 2 Corinthians 10 because I want to, I want to ask a couple questions. And you don't have to answer out loud. But I want to know how to stay in that stronghold or in that dwelling place. Okay? So I am going to go to the Passion Translation 2 Corinthians 10, we're going to close with this. <clears throat> Verse 3, for although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a, pol- a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to ev- effectively dismantle the defenses behind uh, which people hide. So the first part there is you have to realize that this is a spiritual issue. You have to realize it's a spiritual issue. And you have to realize that your weapons are energized with divine power. What are your spiritual weapons? Blake, I need crickets. I'm kidding. What are your spiritual weapons? Prayer. Praise. Praise binds the enemy. Right? Prayer. Even the power of praying in tongues. Open communication. Telling the truth. So important that those weapons, it can be all the fruits of the Spirit, right? I mean, really. They're energized. Can you say energized with divine power? Energized with divine power. See, that's, the, that's another key that we need to realize. They are energized by divine power. It's not just you. It's, they're energized by divine power. Back to the scripture. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. Give no room for deceptive fantasy that opposes God. Don't give room to it. Your thoughts. 
Your thoughts. Like I said, a bad thought is not a stronghold. A lifestyle of bad thoughts, that's, that's the stronghold. That's where the devil has you. And there's, there's, like I said, there's no redemptive solution out. That's what he wants you to feel. There's no way out of this. There's no redemption. If he can keep you feeling that way, he has stolen your identity. He has stolen your identity if he can keep you feeling that way. So give no room for deceptive fantasy that opposes God. And keep your attitude in check. You know, a puffed up attitude it doesn't have any altitude. It doesn't go anywhere. Your attitude, you know, the, the puffed up haughtiness that happens, you know, it, it, it stays with you. It makes you look puffed up. If I have it, it makes me look puffed up. Keeping our attitudes in check is, is so crucial. We capture, like prisoners of war, every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. We capture, like prisoner of war, every thought and insist that it bow in the obedience to the anointed one. So you have to capture every thought, every thought. I'll never forget sitting in a, a discipleship, um, uh, last discipleship, uh, probably the, well, maybe the last one I ever sat with Chris. And, uh, you know, he told us to go home and basically, like, empty our minds and let thoughts flee. Just let them go, everything. And they'll all come back. And start sorting things out. Capturing the thought. And sort it out. Casting down that's flagrant. That's flagrant. Do you get flagrant with your thoughts about it? When the thing just keeps on persisting, it won't let you go. You know, whatever it is that you're faced with, there's so many different things that people are faced with. When you're faced with it, do you cast it down or do you let it in? Don't let it in. Don't let it in. It has no room. It has no room. Capture every thought and insist that it bows its knee. And I love like a, like a prisoner of war. Because you know, prisoners of war, like they're in a camp and they're being told to do whatever the enemy wants them to do. So in this case, they're your prisoners of war. And you're going to tell them to do whatever you want them to do. Capture every thought. We capture, like prisoners of war, every thought. And turn that thought. And at the end here, since we are armed with such dynamic weaponry, maybe you can say dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion as soon as you choose complete obedience. The, the, two, the two crucial parts right there is punish all rebellion against God and always choose obedience. So much easier. Please, please tell, I mean, hear me. Tell me to, hear me. Always choose obedience. Just choose it. Just choose it. Thank you. I will choose it. You, you have to consciously choose it. You have to choose it because the thoughts are coming at you 100 miles an hour. You have to choose. You have to choose. We stand ready to punish. And it's not just like, okay, no, I'm not thinking about that today. Not thinking about that thought today. No, not today. Because uh, if you're just going to say, oh, that's not today. It's coming tomorrow. You haven't, you haven't taken it captive. It's not a prisoner of war. It's kind of floating out there just beyond the fence line. And it's coming back. So you have to stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion. Amen? And choose complete obedience. Could we stand? I, I, just, I just love how Paul, like, I mean, he just tackles this thing. He just absolutely tackles this thing. And he gives, he gives no room for the enemy. 
no room. No wiggle room. I just, I just, I love that. Like, when there's no wiggle room, there's no, it's just, it's just obedience. It's 100% straight up, unadulterated obedience. Just right in the face of every situation. You look at that situation and you go, the situation is telling me this. And you turn. And I've seen so many people up here turn and do the mirror. I saw Eve preached about this, the mirror. And she turned right here. She said, look in the mirror. Here's my situation. It's coming at me. Zoe's my situation right now. She's coming at me. That's a good situation. I'll pick a Weezer's coming at me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Whatever the situation is coming at you, you turn away. And you say, no, my obedience is here in the mirror. I am your likeness, Father. I am your goodness. This is how you created me to function. I don't need that. That situation, that situation, you know what that situation comes with? That situation comes with handcuffs. That that situation comes with a jail cell. Situation comes with a stronghold that you don't want any piece of. It's going to put you behind a wall where you're, you're like, I, I, God, I can't see you. Don't put yourself in that place. Situation comes and turn and face the mirror. This is my true identity. Don't let the devil steal your identity. Don't let him steal it. It's yours. It's no one else's. Your identity. He's given it to you. You're a new creation. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word today. Father, I think that we are new creations. You've blessed us, Father. You've given us everything that we need to live this life. Father, I just pray for the thoughts of the people this morning. As they go, they just start to, they start to realize that they, they, can, they need to take every thought captive. Father, we take every thought captive. And we place it under the obedience of Christ. And if it doesn't match up with the obedience of Christ, Father, we cast it off. We cast it down. Father, I just thank you that we can be secure and sure about our identity. That there's no questions, Father. You don't have any questions. You've you've given our identity to us question-free, risk-free. There's no trial. There's no 30-day thing. Father, It's us. It's us, and it's you. And every situation that rears itself up, puffs itself up against the knowledge of Christ, has no room in our lives. Father, I thank you for our identity. Father, I also thank you for the summertime. Thank you for the sun being out. Thank you for this time together. Father, I thank you for family times. Just as we go this week, Father, bless every single family, people that are even watching online. Father, I thank you that your blessing, it reaches the universe. Not just the earth. It's on the universe. What you've created, you've called blessed. Thank you, Father, for it all. Amen. Amen.